sometimes it's not enough to talk. You have to touch. You have to take the risk of coming close to someone and of sharing their life. You can't just stand on the sidelines. It's the same for God. He could have just spoken to us from a distance or sent a messenger in his place. But he took off his helmet and stepped into our world. God became human. The Word became flesh. The eternal, invisible God became visible for us in Jesus Christ. The name Emmanuel, which you hear in so many Christmas carols, it means God with us. If there is one word that captures the idea of how God continues to reach out to us, it's the word sacrament. A sacrament is a visible sign of invisible grace. It's a special prayer of the church, a ritual that unites us with Jesus Christ and fills us with his Holy Spirit. The sacraments are at the center of what's called the sacred liturgy. This is the solemn public worship of the Christian church. The sacraments help us to worship God in spirit and in truth. They make us holy and they give us the strength to love our neighbor and to witness to our faith. There are so many moments in the Bible when the power of Jesus changes someone's life through a touch. He touches a leper and makes him clean. He takes the hand of Peter's mother-in-law and heals her. He breathes on his disciples after the resurrection and gives them the Holy Spirit. So a sacrament is not just a sign that points to something else, like a road sign directing you from Manchester to Leeds. It's not just a sign that reminds you of something else, like a family photo or a souvenir from Paris. No, a sacrament actually fills you with the power of the Holy Spirit. It makes it real, it makes it present, it takes effect and it changes you from the inside. So here are five key facts about the sacraments. First, there are seven sacraments, three sacraments of initiation that bring you into the fullness of the Christian life, baptism, confirmation, and the Holy Eucharist. Then there are two sacraments of forgiveness and healing. This is confession and the anointing of the sick. And then two sacraments of service or vocation, marriage and ordination. The second fact, the sacraments come from Jesus. He instituted them. They weren't just invented hundreds of years later. They are part of his plan. The actual word sacrament is not used very often in the New Testament. The Greek word is mysterion. But the foundations of each sacrament are very clearly there in the Bible. Third, there is something objective about the sacraments. There is a grace, a spiritual power that doesn't depend on how holy or inspiring the minister is or on the feelings of the congregation. The sacraments are bigger than us. They are a gift. They depend on Jesus Christ and on the faith of the church. And if the church celebrates them properly, then Jesus never fails to work through them. But fourth, you need faith. There is something very personal about the sacraments as well. They are not magic. They are sacraments of faith. If we want them to bear fruit in our lives, to make a difference, then we need to have a living faith and to be open to the graces God wants to give us. We can't just sleepwalk through the celebration of the sacraments. 
And fifth, they are sacraments of eternal life. They give us a glimpse of heaven. We join the angels and the saints in their worship of God. It makes us long to be with him for all eternity. If only we could appreciate the sacraments more and the spiritual power that they contain. I'd have to say Christmas, because I just love the hymns. <laughs> yeah, I remember coming into a church like lowly lit. There was beautiful music, uh, candlelight, and um, just the atmosphere and the, the feeling of God's presence there. Like you can't even say anything. You just walk in and just, wow, you know, amazed. Um, I would say going to Latin Mass for the first time was definitely um, a wonderful experience and I, I found it mind-blowing. Um, so at one of the silent retreats that I went to as a university student, we would have Mass every day. And during those moments, I felt like it was a very powerful service because all of us were going through the same really powerful spiritual experience. And at the same time, it felt a lot more intimate than services in really huge churches. Um, so this, this Easter, um, it was the Easter Vigil, which is when often uh, adults will become Christians and they'll be baptized. And I was at a service where there were multiple adult baptisms. And it was, it was extraordinary seeing these people changing their lives. We sung Alleluia after every time someone was baptized. Uh, really moved, really moved. There's so many, but I think the main most inspiring one for me must be World Youth Day when the Pope celebrates Mass and like so many million young people um, are kind of just there and all are there for the same reason and to just grow together in faith. I was baptised as a baby in the Anglican parish of St Michael and All Angels in West London. I went to visit the church a few years ago. I found the baptismal font at the back of the church, a stone basin of water about three feet wide, with a wooden lid hanging from the ceiling. It was strange to think that my Christian life began there all those years ago. I'm here today in my local Catholic church of St. Charles Borromeo near Oxford Street in central London. The baptismal pool is built into the floor near the front door, just behind me here. If you are baptised as an adult, you step into the pool. It's deep enough to cover you, so you are completely immersed in the water and then you step out the other side and walk into the main body of the church towards the altar. The symbolism is so powerful. The font is like a spiritual bath that washes and cleanses you. It's like a sea, as if you are drowning in the waters and then lifted out to safety. It's like a tomb that traps you in the darkness of death before you rise with Jesus Christ in his resurrection. It's like a womb from which you are born into a new life of faith. Your life will never be the same again. Why do Christians get baptised? Isn't it enough just to believe in Jesus Christ? Well, faith matters, absolutely. But Jesus himself is very clear about the importance of baptism as well. At the end of St Mark's Gospel, Jesus says, anyone who believes and is baptised will be saved. 
Baptism is the gateway to salvation. And at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus tells his disciples to baptize people of every nation. Baptism unites you with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within your soul and you become a beloved child of God the Father. Your sins are completely forgiven and the burden of original sin is lifted from your shoulders. You are given the gifts of faith, hope and charity. You become a member of Christ's body, the church. You share in his priesthood, praying in his name, going out to serve others and sharing your faith with them. Baptism is like a seal that's burnt into your very being. You have an identity which can never be taken away. I now uh, invite Darren and, and Nicola to come and join me here. Who can be baptised? Well, anyone who believes in Jesus Christ and in the apostolic faith, who has repented of their sins and who is trying to live the Christian life. So baptism involves faith, repentance and conversion. It can include children who are brought to baptism on the basis of the faith of their parents and of the wider church. And who can do the baptizing? In the Catholic tradition, it's usually a deacon, a priest or a bishop. But in an emergency situation, if, for example, a ship is sinking and someone asks to be baptized, then anyone can do it. And how do you do a baptism? Well, you immerse someone in water three times or you pour water three times over their head as you say the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And what about those who have not been baptized? Well, we can be certain that God is working in ways unknown to us and we must never judge the hearts of those who have not been baptized. But baptism is such an incredible gift and Christians long for all people to discover it. Five years ago, we built a huge baptismal pool in the middle of our chapel for Easter. We had a wooden frame and large sheets of plastic and many miles of parcel tape. We managed to make it look like a fifth century marble font. It was a beautiful service and the baptisms took place without any problems. But when I went back to the church after the party, the whole place had flooded. The pool had sprung a leak and there was water everywhere. Everything was ruined. I felt like weeping, but then after a moment, I laughed. It felt like another baptismal symbol. Grace gets everywhere. We are not in control. The Holy Spirit fills the hearts of the newly baptized and then spreads over the whole church, going where he wants, touching everything, going beyond our tidy plans. That's the meaning of baptism and of grace. I would really like to be kinder to the people I live with. I would love that. My first thought is my disorganization because I tend to have a very messy desk. But my second thought is my tendency to want to get away from recognizing my own faults. When something's gone wrong, I'm wanting to blame other people. I'd be less lazy so that I could experience a bit more of, of the great things that I've been able to experience when I've been 
on. Uh, I've actually thought about this recently, and I think that when I was much younger, I wish I was more open to say yes to things as I am now. I would want to be um, less fearful, a bit, a bit more bold, um, but still joyful and thinking about others. But, yeah. I think I'd be less pragmatic. <laughs> so, you know, I think I've, I've made a lot of decisions in life, you know, you know, constrained by, you know, by career or by, you know, what, what kind of like makes logical sense career-wise. And I've, um, and yeah, I would have probably taken more risks. I wouldn't change anything because I think God's made me the way I should be and I trust him. <laughs>
the flames dancing before him. His eyes are serene and purposeful, looking intensely at you, the viewer. It's a strange painting. I think it says something about the Holy Spirit and the gift of confirmation. We need to treasure this gift, to protect it, to hold it carefully in our hands. But we also need to offer it to the world. Jesus said that he has come to cast fire on the earth. He sends us out on mission. The Christian faith is too valuable to keep for ourselves. If you are already confirmed, I hope you can appreciate the gift of the Holy Spirit more and more. If you are not, then maybe it's something you can hope for in the future. Let me finish with two well-known prayers. The first is a prayer to the Holy Spirit. It reminds us that we can talk to the Holy Spirit and pray to him just as we can to Jesus and to the Father. It goes like this. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Amen. And the second is a prayer to the Father. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. And if you want to know the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, the best way is simply to ask the Father to send you the gift of his Holy Spirit. My mum, <laughs> she knows the answer to everything. I think my grandma, because the one thing she always kept saying was, if you want to be happy, you have to work to make whomever is around you happy. I'd have to say my Auntie Grace, because in difficult situations, she just knows how to, how to sort things out. <laughs> it's got to be my mother, because she's just acquired so much knowledge and life experience and everything that she puts to good use, um, yeah. I you know, I'm lucky to know a lot of wise people. One person, one person who comes to mind is a senior colleague of mine at the university where I teach in the Philippines. And he always is able to give really good advice. He's able to show different angles to an issue when you're thinking about something and he's able to think of always he's always able to help you make a decision in a place that comes from virtue and goodness